incredible. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pity that Andrew's not here to actually to talk about this. But, you know, it, it's really a wonderful, wonderful uh, revelation, this whole thing. And the whole point is that he said to us, within this frame of reference, that maybe Jesus Christ, this individual, by doing this business, this wonderful, what they call the resurrection, tried to prove to humanity, hang on a minute, fellas, if I can do this, so can you, because you are also naturally living like I am. Here I am trying to show you there's a way to do this. And in that piece of cloth, is distance-coded information. The only image in the world that has in the most incredible way, in its flat two-dimensional surface, a scorch of some blazing type of light that just scorched the surface fibers of this cloth. And in it installed three-dimensional information somehow that machines well, now at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in Texas are able to solicit uh, and show, you know, that this thing can come away from the cloth and you can actually see the image of a man. A man that had a crown of thorns on his head a, and whip marks, a biologically perfect specimen that no pathologist or forensic um, um, doctor can fault in its detail. And the most amazing thing, of course, that might sign it as in fact the, uh, the actual um, body cloth that covered Jesus was the fact that it had a crown of thorns. And the only person that in history a crown of thorns was reserved for in, its, in the death scenario, so to speak, was Jesus Christ. Because if you remember, the Jews, uh, at least the Romans, mocked him with the statement, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. And it was only to Jesus that a crown of thorns was put on. So it can't be anyone else's body relic. It had to be this one specific person. And I tell you what, I am, after so many years of looking at this business, from being totally skeptical, because you know, the, the, the church is full of relic, <laughs> relics and all that through, through history. Yeah, I'll living what, ones. <laughs> this, this one, I tell you, is a genuine article, no question. I'd lay my soul on the line on this. And well, this, how do you see that as a, as a tool for us to learn from and uh, to create well, a body of light he said ahead. to us, Lan, didn't he? He said to us, don't ye know ye are God's, his words, and he was actually trying, I believe, this wondrous being, to tell us all that we have this incredible capacity, and that we've got to guard it because we're living beings that can think and make decisions. And he came here to make sure that maybe we believed in ourselves enough to know that if we thought in a certain way, and he showed us how to do this by his own example, we might in fact be able to escape the grip of a dying mechanism, a universe that has a second law breaking everything up to, you know, in the future, cosmologists now say that the universe is going to be ended. It would be a flat nothingness, cold nothingness, with all atoms unraveled, even subatomic <laughs> particles taken out, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, if, if it's going to be that finite, if it's going to end like that, why do we have meaning? Why am I talking to you like this? Why do we have meaning right in the middle, so to speak, of all of this? I think Jesus was trying to say, if we live for a state of being beyond death and not a state of being in life, we might find the antidote for anything the greys bring to bear on us. I believe the Shroud of Turin, I'll say this, I'm sorry, I don't wish to sound too much like a preacher, but I, I really do believe that the Shroud of Turin is the most powerful illustration paradigm to kind of demonstrate the power over atoms of someone who lives for existence beyond the atomic state. And I think that's why this business of being good and all this is, is, is required by all the great teachers, not just Jesus. There's Gautama Buddha, there's even, and believe me, you know, don't, don't believe that the great prophet of Islam was a, a devil. He wasn't at all. It's the people who came after him that mangled his words and do these terrible things to everybody that actually let him, let the side down. As in fact, I believe the church did 
let Jesus down and so on. It's the people who come after that alter their words and so on that actually lay uh, these terrible things on their laps, so to speak. But the great teachers themselves, if you really go and get uh, the pure word that they made, they never said many of the things that, you know, you get said about uh, them today. And so here was this wondrous being mangling his body for us on a cross, the last thing he could say with all that pain and all that injustice powered on him in this, this piece of uh, wood they call a cross was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I tell you what, mate, sometimes when something drops on my toe and I jump up and, and scream and shout, I try and think of this man with all that terrible stuff heaped on him being able to say this. Now, if you can do that, you're very special. And maybe there is something to us adding things together. I think that's what he means by being good, so to speak. Bring things together. Unite things. Don't break them apart. And the momentum of using our thoughts in this kind of fashion opens up a wonderful future beyond life. Of that I am certain. There really is a, that we continue. This thing I call a soul is an information field, not of this universe. And you cannot destroy it. It really can be used, it can be borrowed, it can be fixed into something else. But you can't destroy that itself. Rather like oil and water don't mix, the field of the soul, the electro, I call it an electrospatial field, a morphogenic electrospatial field, doesn't actually fit with the physicality of our physical universe. It stays and it goes on and on and on. And if we can actually contrive it in a certain way, it goes into another state of being that's wondrous, where all things come together. I call that state the God-verse, if you see what I'm trying to say, for want of a, of a better word. I don't really want to uh, ally that in an anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic religious right. sense, but let's say, if it's you see what right. I'm trying to say, I just call it a God-verse, be as secular as I possibly can about this. Maybe call it an all-verse, I mean, that might be even better, if you see what I'm yeah. trying to say. People have yeah. problems with this God business, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, where, that's the whole point about this. Sorry to go at this tirade pace, but, you know, we've got an hour, and I've got a kitchen, three books worth of... <laughs> <laughs> and I do apologize to you, Lance, and I don't mean to, to kind of hog, hog the whole thing, if you like, but, you know, it really needs saying to, to, to introduce the elements. You can ask me... For now, um, um, you know, little questions on, on how these things, uh, these things actually connect up together in detail, if you like. And, and, and John is there to answer you the, uh, the scientific uh, biochemical um, um, verity of it all, too, if you so want to do. But I, I just wanted to connect up the soul with the greys and the cloth. And I, th I hope I've done that uh, however awkwardly <laughs> in, <laughs> in the last few minutes. <laughs> Well, yes, yes. Um, uh, in, you mentioned, too, that the hybridization program has been stepped up dramatically. And um, I, from your research of the data on the abductions, uh, since they start, first started being noticed, have they increased over the last decade or have they decreased? Well, they've increased, it seems, uh, Lance. It seems that, uh, pr according to the two authorities I trust the most, Professor uh, Jacobs and uh, Bud Hopkins, and they really are wonderful people. They've done the best research, to my mind, on, on this question. And according to them, uh, this is increasing at a pace now. There seems, particularly the Professor Jacobs seems to say, that this particular thing is increasing at such a pace that something is up. And I, you know, I don't, I can't verify this, of course, and I, it's just a speculation, and I have to say this, as, as much of what I try to say is, but you know, you can't make empirical evidence if, if something is against you in this world, as, as, as most people seem to be that control the mainstream, because they don't want the repercussions of anything like the greys kind of, you know, taken seriously uh, for all mankind for various reasons, you know, mm. 
fiscal reasons, whatever. But something there is here, and it's wrong in the state of Denmark, that so yeah. speak, is, is hiding this from all of us. And I do really believe that if this is escalating, and they are, you know, increasing their efforts to synthesize humankind, and our DNA to alter it so that in some kind of way they can meld their programmed artificial mechanistic form of being into ours, then every individual who they can do this to will be interrupted in his natural scale of development. And that scale might preclude that particular individual of an eternity. And that's the terrible thing. That's a big deal. And maybe 2012 doesn't signal the end of the world. It signals the end of natural free thinking. And that, to me, is bigger than the end of the world. Yes, it would be. It would be. Um, what what part do you think the, uh, the the power of the heart plays in in our uniqueness? And some say that the heart has a mind of its own that is actually uh, a very small uh, chamber that is actually like our minds. Um, is isn't well, that a significant difference over a mechanized being to have a heart and to be able to feel and have emotions? Well, our brain is a colloidal jelly, <laughs> if you see what I'm trying to say, right? Yes. And yeah. within the frame of reference of this colloidal jelly, realization occurs, understanding occurs, motive occurs, action is propagated and promulgated, if you see what I'm trying to say. So yeah. however the biological presentation, however that may be constructed and construed, whatever our human aegis might be in its physical biochemical mechanism and, and uh, can I tell you that uh, John Biggestaff is much better qualified to talk about this than I am I have to try to, <laughs> try to be a juggler looking at all the various disciplines possible to put the story together but then I, I rely on some really well, well trodden paths through some clever minds who've done specific things in specific directions and John is a very good direction to go to when you talk about bi biochemistry and so on and maybe you can ask him about this hard question he, he might have a, a better take than I have on it well yes, uh, yes. John what do you think about that and um, you know your expertise is in molecular and cell biology and microbiology um, are, it seems as if a lot of well, the actually, diseases uh, are, um, that are manufactured today are uh, designed in a laboratory, the you know, such as AIDS and uh, many other diseases seem to be uh, occurring the, uh, naturally. Is is that uh, possible? Right. Uh, you know, um, coming to the diseases, but, um, you know, it, it may well be that these diseases are being used as genetic vectors to actually get some of these uh, alien encoded signals into us to make us even want the t technology even more. But to go to your, your, your principle of heart and, and, and caring, really, <clears throat> really, I, I think what's, what's happening here is that our ability to think is really not part of the physical uh, universe in a way. It's enmeshed within it. And, and in, in the living process, it, it sort of uh, it has mechanisms, both in biochemistry and uh, et cetera, by which it, it, it is able to interface with the physical system uh, in the process that we call life. But I mm. think one of the most important things about, about the concept of heart is really, you know, to reiterate what Jesus and what now Nigel is, is sort of saying uh, about Jesus really is that, you know, at the beginning of the universe there was effectively nothing, then there was a big bang and everything came from that. Well, now we know from physics, for instance, that the ability... Um, the, the ability to observe a process happening actually changes that process. In fact, this was done in the 1930s and 40s by physicists, which actually gave us a really big handle on what this concept of consciousness really is. And so really that places any consciousness between these two master boundaries of, you know, of chaos at one end, which entropy is leading us towards, and really this zero point where everything all comes together as one, which is essentially what we were all in the first place. 
Mm. And I think that the concept of caring, really, uh, and, and, and love and all of those emotional, positive qualities tend to... In, it's in the death scenario, so to speak, was Jesus Christ. Because if you remember, the Jews, uh, at least the Romans, mocked him with the statement, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. And it was only to Jesus that a crown of thorns was put on. So it can't be anyone else's body relic. It had to be this one specific person. And I tell you what, I am, after so many scorched the surface fibers of this cloth, and in it installed three-dimensional information somehow that machines now at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in Texas are able to solicit uh, and show, you know, that this thing can come away from the cloth and you can actually see the image of a man. A man that had a crown of thorns on his head uh, and whipped it, it's, it's, a, it's a pity that Andrew's not here to actually to talk about this, but, you know, it, it's really a wonderful, wonderful uh, revelation, this whole thing. And the whole point is that he said to us, within this frame of reference, that maybe Jesus Christ, this individual, by doing this business, this wonderful, what they call the resurrection, tried to prove to humanity Hang on a minute, fellas. If I can do this, so can you, because you are also naturally living like I am. Here I am trying to show you there's a way to do this. And in that piece of cloth is distance-coded information. The only image in the world that has in the most incredible way, in its flat two-dimensional surface, a scorch of some blazing type of light that marks a biologically perfect specimen that no pathologist or forensic um, um, doctor can fault in its detail. And the most amazing thing, of course, that might sign it as in fact the, uh, the actual um, body cloth that covered Jesus was the fact that it had a crown of thorns. And the only person that in history a crown of thorns was reserved for